we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Instead of doing like a bumper video with really cool graphics and everything, I'm just going to have you stand up and I'm going to teach you an old style hymn about heaven. goes a little bit like this. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. As I journey through the land, singing as I go. Souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow. Many arrows bear my soul from without within. But my Lord leads me on, through Him I must win. Oh, I want to see Him look upon His face. There to sing forever of His saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Cares all past, we're home at last, ever to rejoice. Yeah, clap your hands for Jesus. Jesus is coming back. You know about it? Y'all may be seated. Thank y'all for singing with us. Is it all right if we sing a little, a little few songs out of the hymnal? Is that okay? All right, we're in the middle of the summer, which means it's warm. If you turn around right there, you've got Pastor Marshall Blessing handing out waters. And uh, you don't even have to pay us $5 for that, Shelton. Glad to see Shelton and Ann. Can we give them a hand? <laughs> Ann is visiting all the way from jolly old England, and we're so glad that she's here. And Shelton, he's from Texas, around these parts. But we love him, too. We're so glad all y'all are here. There is an afterlife. There better be, because that's the name of our sermon series. There is an afterlife, and I want to tell you that everybody thinks about it. Everybody thinks about the afterlife. Christians and non-Christians alive uh, have always asked the question, what happens after you die? For about as long as there have been mankind, there have been men asking, what happens after we die? Mankind has always asked these questions, and we are assured of death. You are assured of death, and we always wonder what comes next, what comes after death. Mankind has come up with many different answers to the question. Here's some of them they have. They they believe in reincarnation. Some people believe in reincarnation, that you you die and you become something else. And if you were good in this past life, then that means you're going to be something better in the next life. And if you're something worse, you're going to be worse in the next life. So you look at a dung beetle and you don't feel bad about stepping on because he was obviously a bad person in the the previous life, right? Uh, Some people believe your spirit, your spirit, whatever that is, wherever that is, it just floats off into another plane of existence and it finds somewhere else to live in the universe. Uh, Even belief systems that don't believe in the supernatural afterlife are focused on a natural afterlife. So we're talking maybe an atheist or or an agnostic, somebody that's not sure of a supernatural afterlife. They're still focused on an afterlife. They're focused on the physical, natural afterlife. Take this biodegradable urn, for example. Right here, we have a biodegradable urn. You just sprinkle your ashes in this urn. It's got some plant seeds in it. And then you will turn into a tree After you die. So even if you don't believe like in a supernatural afterlife, you could be focused on the natural afterlife and you could be like a bush or some poison oak, some poison ivy or something, right? 
jokes. All right. Even if you don't believe you have a soul or a spirit, you believe that you could go on in your afterlife as being a part of the earth in the ground. So as a Christian, what happens after you die? If you believe in the Bible, do you know what happens after you die? And we, we kind of joked around. One of the major things when we were talking about this series at Staff Meeting, we're like, we always know that heavy Really heavy question. Preacher always throws out. And here it is. If you died today, do you know where you would spend eternity? Everybody's like, oh my gosh, send me to the altar now. Let's pray. Yeah. Right. right? But here's the truth. We don't understand where we will spend eternity. If you don't know what the book of Revelation has about it, has to say about it, then you really don't understand what is going to happen after you die. And the Bible clearly tells us, so we ought to know what's going to happen after we die. I am sure you thought two words when, when I brought up the question, what happens after you die? You probably thought of the word heaven, heaven or you thought of the word hell. hell. All right, good. I'm glad somebody didn't like throw out a random word like heaven, glockenspiel, banana. banana. <laughs> All right, Nick Cage. All right. We, we think of these two words. What happens after you die? You think this whole sermon series is going to be about heaven and hell. And then there's some people that are just turned off to the idea of heaven because it's going to be like an eternity long worship time and they don't like to sing that much. You need to stick with us because we're going to revolutionize your thoughts on heaven, but not just heaven, the entire afterlife. Uh, if you thought of heaven and hell, that's your go-to when we talk about the afterlife then this sermon series is absolutely for you. A major idea of this series is this. The afterlife is a lot more than just heaven and hell. It is a lot more. This series is not meant to scare us. This series is meant to lead us. It is meant to educate us and give us hope. We're gonna, I'm going to give a message today, and there's going to be parts of it are very heavy, but you better know, underneath it all, there is an absolute hope. Even when we preach about hell, let me tell you, there is a hope that you don't have to go there. All right? Here's an overview of this series. I want you to know exactly what to expect. Week one, that's today. We're going to be talking to you about the rapture and tribulation. Rapture and tribulation. Week two, we're going to be talking about reward and millennial kingdom. Week three, heaven week four, hell, and week five, the two resurrections and the two judgments, all right? I want you to make plans, be here every week of the series, all right? And I'm going to be trying, I've got a lot of stuff to cover, so if you have trouble like catching it all, uh, we've got the podcast, and I post all my notes online. You just go to redemption-church.com, click the sermons button, and it'll be right there for you, okay? Before... uh, so make plans. If you've got questions, if you've got questions, also we have the text line, 214-856-0550. You can ask any of those questions. We may answer you in the sermon, or we might just answer you right on the text line. The afterlife is a lot more than just heaven or hell. I want to bring us back to that idea. The afterlife is a lot more than just heaven and hell. Before we dig in, I want to dis- give you a disclaimer on today's sermon. Number one, people are going to disagree with it. You might be in the room and disagree with it. I want to tell you, that is okay. It's all right if we don't agree on all of these things. Some of these things are just interpretational things. We can disagree on like when the rapture is. It's all about coming to faith in Jesus and knowing that he is Lord. Amen. On that subject, we all need to agree. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. This is uh, one way of interpreting in time scripture. It's the way that I understand it best. It's also the way that over the few months studying this all up, I felt really impressed and burdened to, to, to deliver this the exact way I'm going to deliver it today. If you have any questions or disagreements, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Okay, we can talk about it. Uh, this is not a salvational doctrine. Salvational doctrine is only Jesus. It begins and ends with Jesus, all right? We're going to be talking about some things that are absolutely not salvational doctrine. This is interpreting prophecy that in some cases purposely is shrouded by God. 
Some of this prophecy, you're like, I don't understand this. I don't, there's a reason. It's shrouded by God, some of it, absolutely. And if we disagree on some points here, we can still agree on the saving work of Jesus Christ and his cross, and the church said, amen. amen. All right. I want, I want to give you a timeline. Now, as we go through this series, I'm going to fill this timeline out a little more. Today, we're going to be talking about the rapture and the seven-year tribulation. Over to the right there, you see eternity, heaven and hell. All right, we're going to set that to the side. There's a big gap in there. We're going to be filling up the gap in this whole afterlife timeline. One of these things is just to show you there is a lot of things that happen before heaven and hell and eternity. There's a lot more than just heaven and hell on this timeline ahead of us. These things will take place in the future. As I'm speaking to you right now, they have not yet occurred. So everything we're talking about is in the future. I will be covering the rapture and the tribulation today. All right? Let's kick it right off with the rapture. You may be familiar with the word rapture. You've heard of the rapture, right? You've heard of the rapture? You've heard of the rapture? But perhaps you don't know the word rapture doesn't appear in your Bible. Like some people pull that out and that really shakes people. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's not in the Bible, but I really believe in that. I, I, I even sang a song about it, right? Uh, so anytime we believe in something and we can't find it in the Bible... That ought to give us pause. Now you stick with me, all right? Uh, if it is going to be a belief, it should actually be in the Bible, right? All of the church world should hear that. If you're going to have a belief and a doctrine and preach it, it should actually kind of, sort of, be in the Bible. All right? I won't go down that rabbit hole, but I'm tempted. Uh, the word rapture comes from the Greek word Repare, repare, uh, which means seize, snatch, to take away. If you grab something, that is to rapture something. That's the root word of the Greek. Uh, and it's been anglicized and, and turned into English for us, and we call it the rapture. Uh, there is a moment prophesied in Scripture where God will repare, he will seize, he will take away his people his followers will be caught up. So while the word rapture is not point blank written in scripture, this word right here and, and what it means is totally a rock bed of the Christian faith. All right. First Thessalonians 4.16. Let's, let's get some scripture on this point. For the Lord himself will come down with from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. Caught up, everyone said caught up. There is that word that is closely related to the word rapture. They will be raptured. They will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Verse 18. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. All right, man, we, we should encourage each other with these words. Uh, although the word rapture is not written in the Bible, we see the idea right here in the catching away of the church. There will be a catching away. If you want to say rapture, go ahead. There will be a rapture. It is the keeping of a promise that Jesus made to his disciples. How many know Jesus keeps his promises? Yeah. His promises are yes and amen. John chapter 14 verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. I'm going to seize you. I'm going to take you. I'm going to snatch you away with me that you also may be where I am. This is Jesus talking. This is a promise. The rapture is the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus made to his followers. That promise goes to us too. Jesus himself will come to us. You're not going to catch a heavenly greyhound bus. You are going to actually see Jesus at the rapture and be drawn to him. 
Matthew 24 and 30. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus. Jesus will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Jesus is going to be coming on clouds. And it leads me to believe that every nation is going to see him. Jesus coming on clouds is also prophesied in the Old Testament. So we aren't dealing with just like a New Testament idea that's not backed up in the Old Testament. No, the Old Testament, the, the, the prophets of old foretold the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Son of Man on clouds. Check it out, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Most, a lot of our end time prophecy comes from Daniel. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a, say it. Son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. Verse 14. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Anybody remember when Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 said, All power in heaven and earth is given to me. This is it right here. All peoples, nations, And men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So we have this Jesus, the son of man, who has all power in his hand. And he is going to come on the clouds. He's going to come on the clouds. Jesus ascended into the clouds. Anybody know that story? And guess what? He ascended into the clouds. He's going to come the exact same way. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. I love to remind people that Jesus is very much alive in the book of Acts. He's walking around and talking. He's filling people, healing people, doing all kinds of stuff. He's Jesus. Let's read verse 9. After he said this, Jesus, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Verse 10. They were looking up intently. Intently up into the sky as he was going. Then suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Verse 11. Men of Galilee. They said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. I love this picture. You got these disciples. You got these followers of Jesus. And they're like. Here he goes. Do you see him? I think I see him. He's like a dot. He's covered by a cloud. You see him still? No? I don't see him. Where is he at? He's, I don't know. And I guess they'd be just doing that for days. They're like, he's right there last time I saw him. He says he's coming back. And these angels show up and they said, yo, bros, yo, yo. Why are you standing around looking up at the sky? This Jesus, he's going to return in like manner, but... but He kind of told you to go to Jerusalem and wait for what? The power, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus living inside of us. Isn't that beautiful? But this same Jesus, he's going to come on clouds. He left and was covered by the cloud. He's going to come back to us in the exact same way. How is Jesus going to come? He's going to come in the exact same way. He ascended. He is going to descend back to the earth. So here's a question. When is the rapture? That's kind of an important question. How long to know when Jesus will return to catch away his people? How, how long till we know that, that, that moment? When will it happen? There are those that have tried to predict the day of his coming. And that's, that's a faulty thing, man. That's all over the place. Every year, somebody makes a big proclamation. The list of names that have like big evangelists and big pastors and big organizational leaders and denominations have come out and said, well, this is the day that he's coming. You get ready for that day. And then he doesn't come on that day. And they come up with another day. And then it gets ridiculous. And it actually is a very bad thing because it's led some people to fall away. Let me tell you, Matthew 24, 36. No one knows. Let's get this straight. I want you to say 
the first three words of Matthew 24, 36. Let's say it together. No one knows. We're going to say it one more time. No one knows. When is the rapture? No one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. We can look at the seasons, right? Uh, look at the prophecies and compare it to the world to know that his coming is near. But we will never know the day or the hour. Look at the next verse, Matthew 24, 37. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So no one's going to know the day or the hour, but you ought to be able to look at the seasons. You ought to be able to look at the story of Noah and look at the world and say, well, that looks eerily similar. That looks eerily this could be that Jesus is coming soon. Does this make sense? Yes. So let's really quickly talk. How was it in the days of Noah? There was great wickedness. It said it, said it was in man's heart to do evil continually. Every thought that was in their heart was evil continually. That's Genesis 6 and 5. It also says that the earth was full of violence. Genesis 6, 11. Does that sound like the earth? Every time we turn on the news, is there evil happening? Are men constantly inventing new ways to commit evil? Yeah. A new way to rip people off. A new way to destroy people. A new way our, a government is building a weapon of mass destruction. A new way that, that little kids are being taken advantage of and the sex trade is being pr pushed on people. And all, all over the world is continually evil and full of violence. So was it in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. I tell you what, it's really easy to look at the news and feel down and feel down in the dumps and depressed. Uh, something ought to rise up in you. When you see terrible destruction happening, in China there was this unbelievable, unbelievable explosion. We don't know how many people it killed. It killed like a full kilometer radius worth of people. When stuff like that is right before our eyes, it's real easy to get depressed and lost. And God, where are you in the world? I want Matthew 24, 37 to come up in your heart. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. When you see all this destruction, all this rumors of war, all of these things, it should point you, point you, self, to remember that Jesus is coming back. Can you do that, Redemption Church? I, I challenge you to do that. I, every time you see that bad news on the board, you ought to just take a moment and say, thank you, Jesus, that you're coming back. Thank you, Jesus, you're going to rescue us from stuff like this. When is the rapture? This is such a complicated question. You know, your Bible is complicated. Your Bible can be really simple, but it can also be really complicated. Uh, we don't know the day or the hour, but we can look to the signs, seasons, the scriptural prophecy. So really we're asking, when is the rapture in relation to the tribulation? When we look in scripture, the tribulation, the rapture is happening around the tribulation. The tribulation is a period of time foretold in the in Bi Bible prophecy. The tribulation is a period of time. The, per the tribulation isn't one thing that happens. The tribulation uh, in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation, it speaks of two, three and a half year periods. Two, three and a half year periods. You put three and a half together twice, you get what? Seven. seven. The tribulation is seven years. The first three and a half years are the tribulation, and the second three and a half years are known as the great tribulation, but we just call it the tribulation, okay? Now, a study on tribulation could stand alone as, as its own sermon series, right? We don't have that kind of time to devote to the idea of the tribulation today and all the prophecies behind it, but we have studied it in the past, haven't we? Yeah, we studied it in the past. Search our website. Redemption-church.com. 
go to and search Revelation series. We did that about two years ago in, in November, I believe. The tribulation is a period of time that happens towards the end of this age. Actually, at the very end of this age. There will be an antichrist and a false prophet. You ever hear of that? They show up in the tribulation. There will be a one world government. There will be a one world religion and a one world currency. Every time you see something happen with the dollar, you ought to get ready. Because if dollars start fluctuating and they get weak, the world is going to go to a one world government, a one world currency. You mark my words. Just in our last uh, four years, we have seen the currency rating, the, the, the percentage uh, yield of America's borrowing power fall for the first time in the history of the United States. We have Greece falling into a catastrophic uh, uh, financial ruin that's going to bring down the euro. You've got the dollar going down. You've got the euro going down. You get ready, all right? All this is foretold in the book of Revelation. It's going to happen in the tribulation. All this is telling you, hey, we might be getting close. There will be severe persecution for all who believe in Christ. Is there severe persecution for people that believe in Jesus today? You don't have to go very far to see someone being beheaded in the name of Jesus right now. Right now. Not 10 years from now. Right now. The nation of Israel will be deceived by the Antichrist. Now, I don't think that has happened yet. We don't know exactly who the Antichrist is yet. But then, at the end of the tribulation, towards the end of the tribulation, they're going to wake up and they're going to turn back to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. I'm going to say that again. Israel, in the tribulation, is going to turn to Jesus. They are going to turn to Jesus. They are going to receive Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Is that exciting? That's going to happen in the tribulation. The tribulation ends with the Savior, Jesus, returning to conquer Satan and his armies and to rescue Israel at the battle known as Armageddon. All right? When people ask when the rapture will take place, they're really asking where in relation to this whole seven-year tribulation is the rapture. Not everyone agrees with this, of course, right? Uh, Where there are three people, there are probably four biblical opinions. There are four major views. You got pre-tribulation rapture. Could we go uh, to our afterlife um, timeline? We got a pre-tribulation rapture where Jesus takes us before the tribulation. We got mid-tribulation where it occurs somewhere within the seven years. And then post-tribulation where the rapture happens after the seven-year period. Then there are some that think there will not be a rapture. We're not even going to talk about that. We look in scripture, we, see, we think it's very clear that there will be a coming of Jesus where he catches up his church. Amen? Amen. We kind of read it. All right. The importance of the rapture is not when it happens, but being ready for when it happens. Okay? That's, that's the point. I'm not going to nail down one of these today, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. The truth is I hover somewhere between pre-trib and mid-trib. And uh, last week I was like, oh, man, pre-trib, absolutely. And this, this week I was like, mid-trib, what was I thinking? So who knows what I'll be next week. There, a lot of things are shrouded in, by mystery in God. And, and so I'm not really sure about all that. But uh, all has not been completely revealed by God. Why does God do that? That's a good question, right? Why, why, why doesn't God want us to know the exact time or, or the exact month? Or I could put it on my calendar. Uh, because, it is not cl- because it is not clearly understood, every generation of the church age has lived thinking that Christ's return is soon. Now, let me flip this on you because usually people use that as a detractor. Well, they've been saying Jesus is coming for years and I ain't seen him. They've been thinking centuries ago that he was coming, but they were wrong. Everybody thinks that he's coming, but I've not seen him yet. Let me tell you, knock, 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 wake up, McFly, think for a second. Jesus, God has set it up so that his people are always looking for his return. 
that everybody has always looked at the world and looked at the Bible and said, I want Jesus to return. I think he could be coming now. That's not a negative. That's not a knock. That's positive. That's positive, okay? This is actually part of God's design. Okay, so, so take that for what it's worth. God wants a church that's looking for his return. You know, when we read the, the words of Paul, we read the words of Peter, we read that first generation of, of apostolics that are the church age right there. All of them thought he was coming any moment. We need to be that way too, that he's coming any moment. They weren't foolish for thinking that way. They were on fire for God for thinking that way. Amen, amen. Man, you need to be on fire for God in his return. Who is the rapture for? We've asked, when is the rapture? Who is the rapture for? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And what? All right. And the dead in Christ will rise first. The rapture is for the dead. That are dead in Christ. Verse 17. After that, we who are still alive alive are left and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So here's the deal. The rapture is for people that are dead in Christ. They are somewhere in a tomb. They're buried. They're in a coffin. They're long gone. They've not walked this earth in a while. You went to their funeral perhaps. The rapture happens, they're caught up to meet the Lord in the sky. And then we that remain, we're walking around, we're alive. We aren't buried, we aren't dead. We're going to be caught up. So we can deduce from this very clearly that the rapture is for who? People that are dead, people that are alive. Okay, you're not excluded if you died. You're not excluded if you're alive. The rapture is for the dead and the living. The rapture is also for the bride Of Christ, those that are found in Christ, those that have taken on his thing, those that have been buried with him in baptism. The Bible talks about this, that you've put on Christ, you're found in Christ, your identity is in Christ, right? You're a new creature in Christ. The rapture is for those people right there. Let me explain this. The tribulation is for Israel. This is something big to know. This is something you might not have known. The tribulation is for Israel. How do you know that, Pastor Chris? Well, here's how you know it. The prophecy from Daniel tells us about the 77s. Okay, I won't go into all that because it's like way out there stuff. But that's what reveals the seven-year tribulation. And he is speaking, Daniel, to who? Israel. Israel is a rebellious bride. The rapture is for who? The bride of Christ. Israel is a bride that's not ready for his return. Israel is a bride that instead of getting herself ready, she's actually rebelled against him. And so the tribulation is Jesus, is God making her ready, getting her in a place where she will turn again to him. The tribulation is for Israel. The tribulation is not for the bride of Christ the church. The tribulation is not meant for the church. The rapture, the catching away is meant for the bride of Christ that is ready for the surprise arrival of the groom. What's his name? Jesus Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Uh, We spoke in the Bachelor series. Anybody remember the Bachelor series? It was in February of this year, 2015, about the Jewish marriage process. We just talked to, we just preached Jesus out of this marriage process that Hebrews still uh, celebrate this way. The groom would go away to prepare a place for the married couple to dwell. He'd go to prepare a place. We know about a scripture that says that, right? We read it. Yeah, I go to prepare, I go to prepare a place for you, but I will return. The groom's return would be a surprise. And the bride would need to be ready for the moment of his return. Church, bride of Christ, we need to be ready for the moment of Jesus' return. The rapture is for people that are ready. 
The rapture is for a prepared bride. Now, this is going to get heavy and maybe a little weird for some people, but it's what I do best. Heavy and weird. I am about to share something with you that's not popular doctrine, not popular teaching at all. Uh, It won't take you long to find someone who disagrees, but I believe it's important to share. Many people, most people believe that all believers, somebody said all believers, believers. will be taken at the rapture. So if you've ever said a sinner's prayer, if you believe that Jesus is the Lord, if you've ever called on the name of the Lord, all that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, everyone that that fills that criteria, they're all going to be taken in the rapture. And if that's true, praise God. He's faithful. He's full of love. He loves us. Praise God for that. Praise God. But my heart has been burdened at the chance of a different outcome. If there was a different outcome that, that perchance happened, and number one, this what I just told you about everyone, every believer's taken, that's the popular doctrine. So if that's not what happened, there are gonna be a lot of people that are like, what just happened? And because of that, because I've found things in the Bible that I think bear merit, I'm going to share this with you. Please keep an open mind uh, to what I share. And always test it with scripture. We'll test it with scripture together. That's what I've been trying to do myself. What if not all believers are raptured? How would you feel if others were raptured and you were not? How would you feel if your wife was raptured and you are not? How would you feel if your child was raptured and you are not? Pastors, how would you feel if your congregation is raptured and you are not? Would you be mad? Would you be mad that no one told you that that could happen? Would you be mad at the people that said, no, you're okay, you're all right? Would you be wondering why you aren't taken? Would you be afraid? Would you believe that there's now no hope for you? Because one of those things in that, that popular doctrine that every believer has taken is that if you miss that rapture, goodbye sucker. There's no more hope for you. God's now going to turn to Israel and he's done with you. Whoa. So if you believe that popular doctrine, you're left here on earth after the rapture, you probably believe there's no hope for you. The more I study scripture, the more I think it's possible This outcome of not every believer taken in the rapture. Because I think it is possible. I think it is worth bringing to your attention. Revelation 19 and 7 says that the lamb has a bride that has made herself ready. It says those words. Bride that has made herself ready. Who made the bride ready? All right. Now we're saved by the blood of Jesus. I'm not saying salvation by works. But I'm talking about a bride that looked at the world around them and said, I don't need to mess with this stuff. I need to be looking for the coming of Jesus. I need to make myself ready for the return of the groom. Is that what it says? That's what it says. A bride that is prepared. A bride that has made herself ready for the groom. That is who the rapture is for. Matthew 25 speaks of five foolish virgins and five wise virgins. Raise your hand. You know the parable, right? You know this story. The foolish virgins ran out of, they ran out of oil. They had no more light in their lamp. Uh, And they ran to buy some. But while they were out, the groom showed up and he took the five wise virgins who were prepared and ready for his arrival. Jesus is the groom that will return for wise, prepared brides. Of course, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. We, that's, a, that's another Bible study for us. But the parable of the wise and foolish servant echoes this same message. This is another parable of the wise and foolish servant. One servant was not prepared for the master to return. But the wise servant was prepared. The master returns and takes the prepared servant to another place, to a higher place, to a deeper place in his kingdom. He gives him new authority and he gives him new instruction and a new title. 
but he puts that servant in charge of nothing. He casts the one out that wasn't prepared. Does this sound a lot like the parable of the wise and foolish virgins? Right in the middle of that, that parable, it says in Matthew 24, 44, so you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Listen, he's coming at, a, at an hour you don't expect him. So what do you need to do? Be ready. Be prepared. We are told repeatedly to keep watch, to be ready, to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. I am afraid that we aren't doing that. I could talk about the church world in general, but can I talk to this house of believers right now? I am afraid that we aren't looking. I am afraid that we in this room, you watching online, that we aren't prepared for Jesus' return. And that's serious. And I need you to listen up. I fear that we think saying a sinner's prayer is enough. I am certain that we think going to church is enough. We are to be watching, waiting, hoping, longing for the day of the return of the one hope of all creation, Jesus Christ. Honestly, are we doing that? If you miss the rapture, let me give you some peace right here. If you miss the rapture, you can still be saved from hell. Yeah. Praise God. Now, I'm going to explain this in a few weeks. I know that, that seems like a cop-out, Leon. Please don't walk out on me. We're going to explain that in a few weeks. You need to come back for it, okay? But uh, if you miss the rapture, you are not saved from the tribulation. That seven-year period. But I believe you can still be saved from hell. Now, that's not something that's said in any church like I've ever really grown into. Maybe in small Bible studies in the background. But we're just putting it right out here because we believe it's important. Uh, If you miss the rapture, I, I want you to know right now that there's still hope. There is always hope in Jesus. Have you ever found the moment where there wasn't hope in Jesus? Even after you did that awful thing, you'd never think he would forgive you from. Did you find hope in Jesus? After this terrible calamity and you lost more than you could ever fathom losing in your life, did you find hope in Jesus? Let me tell you, wake up because there's always hope in Jesus. If something happens and the rapture happens and you aren't taken, let me tell you, there is hope in Jesus. There's hope in Jesus. Always, always, always. Now that's something that's not said in churches. But I said it, so there we go. If you miss the rapture, if you miss the rapture, it is because you did not love Jesus enough to be ready for his return. Let me tell you, it's not going to be because, well, I just had that one sin problem. We had a question the other day on the, the search engine series. What if I'm driving along and I run into a tractor trailer and I say a curse word right before I die? If you miss the rapture, it's not because of that curse word. It's because your life didn't love him enough to be ready for him. A bride that loves her groom is getting ready for the day of the marriage. That's what a bride does that loves her groom. And so if you miss the rapture, you're just like the foolish virgins who had other stuff going on and they lost track and they went away to take care of other things and missed him. You need to love Jesus enough to be ready. Matthew 25, 13, therefore keep watch because you do not the day know the day or the hour. Luke 21, 36, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. Could that be about the tribulation? And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-control, under self-control. The, the foolish virgins fell asleep they woke up and they're like our lamps are out of oil do not be like others who are asleep 
Redemption Church, I don't care about the other churches everywhere. Do not be like the other churches that are asleep. And most of the churches in America are asleep. Most of the Christians in America are asleep. Do not be like others who are asleep. But let us be alert and self-controlled. Church of Thessalonica. You don't think, you don't think that Paul has that kind of intensity behind those words? You think I'm overreacting? He's trying to wake up a church that's fallen asleep. Wake up. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. I love that. And he will appear a Second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Revelation 3 and 3. Remember, therefore, what you have received. Say that first word. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not, wake up. I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. He's talking to a church. He's not talking to sinners. He's not talking to backsliders. He's talking to people that went to church. He's talking to us. Revelations 3.10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently... I will also keep you from the hour of trial. Oh, what could that be? The tribulation. tribulation. That is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Is it come to test the church? It's come to test who? Those that live on the earth. We don't live on the earth. Praise God. That's not our living place. We live in his presence. We go to be with the groom. That's where we live. That's where we live. Praise God. In Revelation 2 and 3, it speaks about seven candlesticks. So I I just gave you a bunch of scripture. I've got another support for this shocking claim, and it, it takes a little explanation. So please bear with me. Don't fall asleep. Wake up. In Revelation 2 and 3, it speaks about seven candlesticks. The seven candlesticks represent seven churches. These were actual church congregations at the time of John when he wrote the letter of Revelation. But they serve as a dual prophecy. They speak in the moment to those churches prophetically. But it also speaks to future events prophetically. That is dual nature. We talked about that before at church. They spoke directly to those churches, but they also serve as prophecy to us today. God speaks to the seven churches. Who speaks? God. Okay. It actually says that he walks in the midst of the seven candlesticks. So the seven candlesticks represent? Seven churches. So Jesus, God, is walking in the midst of him. So these are not like churches that have no God showing up. He's walking in the midst of them. So this prophecy is to these seven churches. But wait, 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 wait. Uh, why doesn't, isn't there just one church of Jesus Christ? I know a lot of people might be thinking that. So why seven? What's this about? I think the best answer is that the seven churches named in Revelation 2 and 3 represent church eras since the birth of the church in Acts chapter 7. If you look and uh, people that are like uh, Bible scholars have looked at the order of it starts with Ephesus and it goes down Smyrna and it, it lays them out on a timeline of church history and you can see uh, qualities and descriptions being played out in church eras. Might be this way, might not be this way. But I, that's one of the major explanations, I believe. So that would be one church, but he's speaking to several eras. Also, that would be really useful if those eras are in order and we know where we are in the eras. Right. Wouldn't that be powerful? Yeah, it would lead us to know a little bit about when the tribulation is coming. So whether you agree or not, uh, the point I want to make is the promise that he makes to each church. When God speaks to the churches, he gives them one of three things. One of three things. Number one, he praises them. 
Not every church is praised. There's, there's one that's not praised. He offers them a well done. He looks at that church and he says, this is, you're doing really well. You suffered all this persecution, but you stayed faithful. And he, he's giving these praises. Number two, he offers them a judgment. Two churches don't receive a judgment, but the other five do. He offers them a judgment. He says, this is an area where you are wrong and you need to correct it. Does that make sense? And then number three, he offers them a promise to the overcomer. Somebody say the overcomer. The overcomer. Someone say the victorious. the victorious. That's how the NIV reads. We're gonna, I'm going to quickly give you all seven promises to the churches. So to the church at Ephesus, here's your promise. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. To the church of Smyrna, here's your promise. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. We're talking about that later in this series. Uh, To the church of Pergamum, to the one who is victorious, I will give some of my hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone and a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Theatria, that church, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter. To the church of Sardis, here's your promise, Sardis. The one who is victorious, like them, be, he'll be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before the Father and his angels. The church of Philadelphia, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Oh man, I wish I had time to talk about that. My new name. That's fascinating. And then fat, last, the church of Laodicea. Here's your promise. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Now get this. We got seven churches and there's seven promises right here. But these promises aren't to the entire church. Here's the church of Ephesus. You guys, the one that is victorious. The group of people that are victorious. I gave you some judgments, some things that you aren't getting right. Those people that get it right, they are going to be with me on my throne. The people, I I gave you praises and I told you to hold on to what you've got. The people that do that, you are going to be victorious. But he, it's very clear here. The promise is not going to be received necessarily by the entire world church to the one who is victorious these promises are to those in the church who are victorious these promises and rewards are very similar to the promise and rewards to those that are raptured i believe they are one in the same and we're going to discuss the promise and reward of the rapture next week don't have time today but right now i want to ask you are you ready For the return of Jesus. Are you victorious? When he corrects you, do you repent and get it right? Do you hold on to the things that he's given you? Do you watch? Are you waiting? Are you the one that's waiting for the groom to come? Are we guilty of watching and waiting on other things? There are those in the churches of Revelation 2 and 3 that may be saved from hell, but not saved from the tribulation. Okay? I have to warn us that there may be those in church with us today, watching us on the internet today, that you're saved from hell. Praise God. That is nothing to not shout and thank the Lord for. But the way you're living right now, you might not be saved from tribulation. You may miss the groom when he comes. Here, can I tell you what's the hardest thing about being a pastor? The hardest thing about being a pastor is coming to church today and you know that the Lord is showing up but you see people miss him. The hardest thing about being a pastor is God has told you to preach a word and you know it's for somebody and you preach that word and you see them sit there unmoved. 
the, the hardest thing about being a pastor is you know somebody's going through trials and tribulations and so much heartache, yet they sit there and they don't come to the altar. They sit there and they don't enter into the presence of God. They sit there and they are just showing up. You want to be in the rapture? Yeah. Church. Jesus. You want to be ready when Jesus comes? I want you to be ready. Yeah. I, want, I want to be ready too. I want my family to be ready. Amen. I want my wife to be ready. I want everybody in this room to be ready. Yes. You need to reorganize your life and make that, make Jesus, make the return of Jesus your top priority. That sounds crazy. You don't understand, I gotta go to school. You don't understand, I gotta mow the lawn. You, you don't understand, I've, there's a new movie coming out. You don't understand, there's, I gotta go on a date. You don't understand, no, 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 no. Make the return of Jesus your number one priority. Can you do that? The church of the book of Acts did it. Those that died, the death of martyrs did it. I believe that when Philip looked up and saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father, he really thought, he's returning right now? He's returning right now? <laughs> Whatever it takes to be ready for Jesus to come, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Well, that's what we need to do. If you aren't sure what, what that is, that's more than fair. You're not sure what that is, okay? Okay then you need to meet one of our pastors up, up at the front when we open this altar for prayer. Jesus. You need to do it. If you even have just a worry, that there's no shame in it. You come and do it. I've given you a lot to think, uh, think through, okay? And I, I want you to take time to think about it. But let me close with something simple. Paul makes the rapture. He makes heaven. And being with Jesus in the afterlife, really simple. Here it is, 2 Timothy 4 and 8. This is our last scripture. Let's look at it together. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. There is a rapture reward coming for Paul. But not only for Paul. The reward is coming to all who For all who long for his appearing. Can I tell you this? You can't fake this. You have to really long for his appearing. You can, you can fake some people. They walk in the door. You're like, oh, that so and so's coming over. Oh, I can't. I don't want to hear. Their voice just drives me crazy. Oh, hello. I'm so glad to see you. Is that a new dress? You can fake it with a lot of people. You cannot fake this. Jesus is coming. He's got a crown for those that are longing, waiting, watching for his appearance. Have you done that today? Have you longed for his appearance today? While we were singing those worship songs, did you just say, God, I want to be closer to you. God, I want your presence here. God, sweep me away. Take me where I'm supposed to be. You can't fake this. You see, you actually have to love Jesus. You will not be in heaven if you don't love Jesus. I feel very confident in saying that. What does it take to be saved? It needs to start with this. You believe in Jesus and you love him. Yeah. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Do you love him? All right. You can't fake it. The coming of Jesus is ahead of us. I want to point out real quick that the crown is available to those who are perfect? No. no, we're not going there. The crown is going to those that gave all their life savings to the church. No. The crown is for all those that are, are, are completely without sin and they haven't sinned in 25 years. No. The crown is for those that simply love when Jesus shows up. The coming of Jesus is ahead of us, but the crown is available when? I want that scripture back up there. When is the crown available? When the rapture happens? What's the first word of that verse? Now. 
When is the crown available? Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. That crown can be available to you now. The hope and the promise of Jesus taking you from a world of death and anger is available for you now. These altars are open. Why don't you have a now moment with Jesus? I want to pray with somebody today. Can Thank you for joining us. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com and be sure to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter.